I've been in the climate space a long time. Um, one of the, I did a project about 10 years ago for the Department of Energy um, looking at all of the energy flows through the US and the global economy in incredible detail. So I can tell you um, ridiculous things about the US energy flows, like 0.9% of US energy flow is using natural gas to pump natural gas through about 1.2 million miles of pipeline. 0.2% of US energy flow is used in abattoirs for killing live animals. 0.6% um, of US energy flow is getting kids to school on a school bus. So. That was an effort to understand all energy flows so you could look at all of them and figure out how do you decarbonize all of those human activities that sit under those flows. That became a book called Electrify. Um, it was hugely successful for the very small audience I wrote it for, which was basically the incoming president of the last election. So it was a love letter to Joe Biden. Um, a lot of the work was behind the thinking, behind rewiring America's role in helping develop the IRA. There was a lot of people and a lot of organizations that did that, but very proud of our piece. Um, so you can get to crazy questions about details of energy flow later, but maybe I'm going to... Um, I'm going to frame the climate problem slightly differently to how Joel did it. In wonky corners of the climate science universe, they talk about committed emissions. If you bought a gasoline-powered Volvo two years ago, that Volvo is going to live another 22 years, or if it's a Volvo, maybe 50, and it will be emitting carbon dioxide for the entire life. So there's one billion machines that burn fossil fuels in America. There's 111 million in Australia. There's about 18 million in New Zealand, and we know this because we now count the machines that are left to decarbonize. If all of those probably around 8 billion machines globally, somewhere between 8 and 20, that are burning fossil fuels, if all of them live out their natural life, so if that Volvo lives out its natural life, your water heater that runs on gas lives out its natural life, the carbon emitted because of those takes us to around 2 degrees. So with perfect execution, replacing every machine as it fails with the electric solution, because the solution for nearly every one of those energy flows is to do it electrically, um, that still takes us over the carbon dioxide limit. And that brings up a point, I know we're here for optimism, but I'm gonna, and, you know, spoiler alert, I may not be completely optimistic about AI's role. Why? Uh, in the early 2000s, there was a great new technology idea called BEX, that's bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. It sounded like the perfect thing, it was invented by people at Harvard who oversold it as a solution. The idea being we can cut down trees and forests and things, burn them, grow the trees and forests again, capture the carbon dioxide, and you've got carbon negative energy producing technology. They sold it so hard that we started modeling that into the IPC scenarios for one and a half degrees. We've now modeled in, because of that, the fossil fuel companies like, yay, this gives us a chance, we'll just really sell negative emissions technologies. And we've now modeled in 20 gig, in all of those charts that come out at one and a half or two degrees, we're capturing more than 20 gigatons of fossil fuels, uh, of carbon dioxide per year in the latter half of this century. Let me put that in perspective for you. We burn 10 gigatons of fossil fuels per year today. So we are imagining building an industry twice as big as the world's three largest industries in a few decades to pump a negatively priced product into the ground, right? It is never going to fucking happen. So anything you hear about net, you know, net zero 2050 is a lie based on the fossil fuels lobbying to include these negative emissions to buy themselves extra time. What is the value of carb the carbon embodied in the negative emissions that are now built into the IPC scenarios? At wholesale energy prices, it's $30 trillion, and at retail, it's $300 trillion. So we're giving $300 trillion to the fossil fuel industry to fight against the project we're in this room for the next 50 years. That's because we oversold a technology idea. I remember seeing a graph at Google in 2006 that showed Google's energy consumption, which is all electricity. They were very concerned. It's the second largest expense after payroll at Google. And they were going to be using all of the world's energy, electricity supply by 2050 as one company on the growth rate they had in 2008. 
the growth rates, someone just told me today, we've now upped the growth rates of data servers in the world at 4x of that, be largely because AI has come along and we need so much compute. So there's a very good chance that we make the problem a lot worse, especially if we bet on AI as the solution. So that's my sanity check. Sorry to offend you. Um, it might be the fact that I took one class in AI when I was at MIT and a guy called Marvin Minsky taught it. And he doesn't believe we have AI yet, neither do I. We have machine learning. Machine learning is great. That's why everything on that list was an optimization problem uh, on Joel's list, which I largely agree with. There is a role for lots of things for AI to optimize, but the optimizations are going to be the two and three percent at the end, right? What we actually have to do is build 20 billion physical machines, install them with labor in all of the places where all of those machines, and we've got to do it in 20 years to have any chance of saving any coral reef. Fairly important to save the coral reefs in terms of, you know, two billion people get their primary proteins from the ocean. So think about that. So we're really up against it on time, and I think the honest assessment is that this is about hardware deployment. I, was build, I built climate hardware technologies for 20 years in Silicon Valley. I gave up in 2019 because the most expensive thing about every hardware project we ever did was regulation. Every, te every technology had the FAA, FAA between you and success, or the FCC, or you know, infinite, even building codes. Um, so that's why I started Rewiring America, recognizing that we have to go after policy and we have to go after regulation. That gave us the IRA. The IRA has actually set a new bar globally for new policy. But this is, uh, I think a, a thing that we have to understand is it isn't a technology problem. It's now a regulatory problem. It's a policy problem. We study the economics in, of what electrification means for an economy. If Australia electrified all of its 11 million households, Today, we would save $3 trillion as a country by 2040 and be at zero emissions. So a whole bunch of countries in the world, basically, if you don't produce oil and gas, so oil and gas is expensive, if you've got a mild climate uh, and you've got good renewables, it already is economic. But even Australia, New Zealand, a whole bunch of countries across the middle of the world aren't doing it because they don't have access to finance. Right? So only America can print money to do something like the IRA. In the rest of the world, you have to, you have to finance, the, finance the project somehow. So I'm going to emphasize, maybe it's an unusual thing, but you know, really the biggest barriers for climate are regulatory, finance, and then supply chain. Right? So we've got to finance 20 billion machines, we've got to build 20 billion machines, we've got to install all those machines. I think there's plenty of opportunity for AI to help but I want to start out with a pretty honest, like, this is what we have to do. Sorry, that wasn't what you wanted, is it? No. <laughs> no, that's, that's but that, Your fault for getting a guy with jet lag up no, here. No, 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 no. I was like, no, that, this, is, this is a real conversation, folks. This isn't just like a show. So what we're really trying to do, and that's why I wanted Joel to start off, boom, here's the, all the buckets we got to do, and I wanted you to actually just lay out what you think is happening. We're up against the wall, we need policy, we need all that kind of stuff. But what I'm also going to say is we have a new, we want to, oh, you got a minute left here. Two that minutes is, of optimism. All right. give, give me two minutes of optimism. <laughs> but then we're going to go to actually solutions for the AI that could help, maybe. Yeah, so there is a level setting in a pretty blunt way. Um, so we lie to ourselves, it, put us, it puts us $300 trillion behind, and the problem is regulatory finance and policy. Um, what can AI do? So a lot of people are going to say, well, let's optimize energy flows on the grid. You might get a 2 or 3% win there. Material science would be great. If we can, you know, there's already people applying machine learning to fusion and the control of fusion generation systems. Even if that AI works, it's unclear that we can get fusion to market in less than 20 years because you have to build the thing, so it's a hardware problem, so it may not arrive in time for the solution, but we should still be doing that. Uh, we need material, new materials everywhere. So whether that's low temperature or room temperature superconductors, uh, building materials, et cetera, et cetera, we have to do that. Just on the cautionary side of materials, 
I'm actually pretty optimistic here, but like some, whoever invents a solid state heat pump, that's a really important thing, so I'll throw that one out. That's a materials problem. Um, the material problem is a regulatory problem, and I'll say this. My next book I'm writing is actually on stuff, which is about all the embodied energy in the world. What the slide you showed about energy growth declining in first world countries is not true. America now imports probably 20% of its energy as embodied energy from China. 3% of your emissions is Australian coal being burnt in China to make Barbie dolls. So you ha we haven't yet turned the corner. The developed economies haven't yet turned the corner. And I say this because if you build a house, actually the building codes dictate how much the house weighs. So you can reverse engineer from the building codes a model for the weight of an American house. An American house now weighs minimum 220 and as much as 350 tonnes. That's an average 2,400 square foot house. Houses now last about 30 or 40 years. They on average have 2.6 people in them. So we've got a tonne and a half of the embodied energy of materials per year per house per person. And that's a regulatory problem. So whoever, and I applaud everyone, is going after the material science problems, you're going to have to change the building codes at the same time as you're doing your heroic tech startup. <laughs> um, so there's that. Both of those are good. Uh, I think AI everywhere where it can be used to stop us commuting, stop us flying places, is great. Huge wins to be had in avoiding transportation, which is already happening with Zoom, but I think we can expect that to go further. The dark side of that is cheapest, the way to lower the emissions of an American born today is plug them into AI virtual world and have them not move from the basement, which I think is the model of my, my Amer half American teenager. Um, so, but I think that serious point there is we can do a lot to entertain ourselves. Sorry, it wasn't, that, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't that optimistic. Gonna... <laughs> you were on a good roll there for a minute there. <laughs>